The region of Sudan has always been like the underdogs of African history, but apparently the Greeks didn't feel that way. What up African world, it's your boy Home Team here. I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And today we're going to talk about the top 10 Africans in Greek mythology. But before we begin, I have to clarify some things. So the Greeks would frequently talk about these people they called the Ethiopians. Now historically, Ethiopia in Greek mythology has always been placed in different regions over time as their mythology developed. But later, the term Ethiopian began to be exclusively used for Africans. Now the Ethiopian Greek mythology doesn't refer to modern day Ethiopians, but actually Sudanese people because the Greeks had much interaction with them. Many Greek scholars even designated a capital for Ethiopia, which was Meroe. So over time, it became pretty clear that the Greeks were actually talking about the Kushites of Sudan and other African ethnic groups within the Sudan region. Now, according to Diodorus, the majority of Ethiopians, especially the ones that dwelt along the Nile River, were black-skinned, flat-nosed, and woolly-haired. Other Greeks even noticed the diversity amongst Ethiopians, saying that some of them had long or curly hair. This is a pretty accurate description of what we see today in modern day Sudan. So let's get right into the top 10 Africans in Greek mythology. Coming in at number 10, we have Aethopes. Aethopes was a part of a large Ethiopian army sent to Troy to aid them in the battle against the Greeks. Aethopes was one of the most beloved warriors amongst the Ethiopians. And upon his death on the battlefield, the tide shifted drastically, ironically in the favor of the Trojans and their Ethiopian allies. For number nine, we have Gerana. Gerana was the most beautiful queen of the pygmy people of Southern Africa. Gerana, basking in her own vanity, boasted to be more beautiful than the goddess Hera. Of course, Hera felt some type of way about this and in all her jealous fury, proceeded to transform Gerana into a crane. As a crane, Gerana dearly missed her son, Mopsus, and proceeded to visit him every winter, but because he did not recognize her, he armed himself in defense. This was the origin of the endless war between the pygmies and the cranes. Next, at number eight, we have Amathion. Amathion's story is short and sweet. While Hercules was on his random killing spree, he went down the Nile into Ethiopia and killed King Amathion. Amathion did attack him first, but he probably was just taking preemptive action due to the fact that Hercules was clearly killing nearly everyone in sight. Amathion comes in at number 7 just because of the stock he comes from. You'll understand later. At number 7, we have Eurybates. Eurybates was the herald for the Greek armies during the Trojan War. He served as Odysseus's squire. Homer himself goes out of his way to describe Eurybates for us. He states, A favorite herald in his train I knew, His visage solemn, sad, of sable hue, Short woolly curls o'er fleeced his bending head, O'er which promontory shoulders spread, Eurybates, in whose large soul alone Ulysses viewed an image of his own. So basically in 24th century language, Homer pretty much said that Eurybates was a faithful and strong black guy who was adored by Odysseus because they were of the same mind. Eurybates was a man who actually retrieved Bucyrus from Achilles' camp. Coming in at number six, we have Bucyrus. Bucyrus was a king of Egypt in a time when Egypt was suffering uninterrupted scarcity. Thus, Bucyrus sought the counsel of an oracle. The oracle declared that the scarcity would cease if the Egyptians would sacrifice a foreigner to Zeus every year. Busiris made the beginning with the prophet himself and afterwards sacrificed all foreigners that entered Egypt. Hercules on his arrival in Egypt was likewise seized and led to the altar, but he broke his chains and slew Busiris together with his son Amphidamus. Breaking our top five, we have Chericlea. The story of Chericlea comes from the Ethiopica, which literally means the Ethiopian story. Chericlea was the daughter of King Hydaspes and Queen Persina of Moreau. Strangely enough, Chericlea was born an albino or white-skinned 
because her mother gazed upon a painting of a white princess while she was pregnant. Persina, fearing accusations of adultery, gives her baby to a priest to be taken care of in Egypt. Chericlea is then taken to Delphi and made a priestess of Artemis. Theogenes, a noble Thessalonian, comes to Delphi and the two fall in love. He runs off with Chericlea with the help of Callisiris, an Egyptian who was employed by Persina to find Chericlea. They encounter many perils like pirates, bandits, and others. Chericlea ultimately ends up in Moreau, where her father is about to sacrifice her to the Nubian gods. Persina begs Hydaspes not to do it and reveals to him that she is his daughter. Obviously baffled by this proclamation, Hydaspes does not believe it and demands proof. Chericlea, as proof, then proceeds to reveal the black skin above her left elbow, which proves her African ancestry. For number four, we have Queen Marina. Queen Marina was a queen of the Amazons of Libya in ancient times long before the Trojan War and ruled during the beginning of Egyptian civilization. Diodorus speaks on Marina's exploits in length. He states that Queen Marina led an expedition into Libya and won a victory over the people known as the Atlanteans, destroying a major city called Kearney. Queen Marina conquered several peoples and regions including the Syrians, the Arabians, and the Sicilians. The Amazons were diverse as they recruited women from conquered regions into their ranks. However, what was interesting about Queen Marina was her loyalties to Egyptians and Ethiopians, alluding to her own origins. Diodorus states, As for Marina, the account continues. She visited the larger part of Libya, and passing over into Egypt, she struck a treaty of friendship with Horus, the son of Isis, who was king of Egypt at that time. Diodorus also states that there were Ethiopians living in Libya during this time, and while Marina conquered all the people in Libya, she left the land of the Ethiopians alone because she considered their land to be sacred. This idea points to a very strong ancestral relationship between Queen Marina and Ethiopian people. According to Diodorus, Queen Marina was said to have an army of 30,000 foot soldiers and 3,000 cavalry since they favored to an unusual degree the use of cavalry in their wars. Breaking our top three, we have the Candace of Meroe. A legend in the Alexander Romance claims that the Queen of Meroe fought Alexander the Great when he came down into Nubia. The story is that when Alexander attempted to conquer her lands in 332 BC, she arranged her army strategically to meet him and was present on a war elephant when he approached. Having assessed the strength of her armies, Alexander decided to withdraw from Nubia, heading to Egypt instead. The Kandaki queen of Meroe had this to say to Alexander upon his departure. Do not despise our color, for we are whiter and more brilliant in our souls than the whitest among your people. Coming in at number two, we have Andromeda. Andromeda is the beautiful daughter of an Ethiopian king named Cephas. Andromeda's mother, Cassiopeia, led by her pride, proclaims that Andromeda is more beautiful than Poseidon's precious Nereids. The Nereids are the nymph daughters of the sea god Nereus, and they are often seen alongside Poseidon. Poseidon apparently takes offense to this proclamation and proceeds to send a sea monster, Cetus, to wreck the Ethiopian coastline as some sort of divine punishment. Andromeda's father, desperate to save his kingdom, went to the oracle of Apollo to seek advice. To his horror, the oracle told him that he must sacrifice Andromeda to the sea monster. Andromeda was then stripped naked and chained to a rock on the Ethiopian coastline. Returning from having slain Medusa, Perseus saw the chained Andromeda and was awestruck by her beauty. 
He approached the sea monster cloaked, invisible from wearing Hades' helm, and killed the creature. After he set Andromeda free, he made provisions to marry her, even though she was promised to her uncle. Now early depictions of Andromeda portrayed her as the proverbial beautiful white princess desperate for a savior. But as the mythology evolved, Andromeda's whiteness began to be challenged by Greek and Roman writers because of her origin. The story of Andromeda no longer needed to be a Greek one advancing Greek needs, but it quickly became universal. Ovid, the Roman poet, made sure to highlight Andromeda's blackness or African origin, referring to Andromeda's dark skin. Ovid states, I may be short, but I have a name that resounds worldwide, and this I take as my measure. And though I am not pure white, Cephas's dark Andromeda charmed Perseus with her native color. White doves often choose mates of different hue, and the parrot loves the black turtle dove. Sappho, the Greek poet from the island of Lesbos, confirmed the dark complexion of Andromeda. She states, If I am not dazzling fair, Cephas's Andromeda was fair in Perseus's eyes, though dark with the hue of her native land. Sappho is basically saying that Perseus didn't even care that Andromeda wasn't Greek at all. All he saw was a beautiful woman. The story of Andromeda is a classic case of jungle fever. A Greek man falling in love with an African woman. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the legendary Memnon. Memnon makes my number one list because his story exemplifies Greek ideas concerning Africans at that time. Attributes such as beauty, strength, courage, and kindness. According to the mythology, Memnon was an Ethiopian king and the brother of Amathion. He was also the son of Tithonus and Eos. He was revered as a warrior and even penned as being on par with Achilles in skill. He brought an army of Africans to Troy's defense during the Trojan War, a number that could not be counted. Among them was Memnon's beloved Athopes. Memnon's death matches in significance to Hector's. According to Quintus of Smyrna, after Memnon's death, the Trojans retreated to their city and grieved for Memnon. Zeus himself was moved by the tears of Memnon's mother and allowed him immortality, and he was worshipped as a deity. Memnon arrives at Troy after an argument between Palatimus, Helen, and Priam concerning whether or not Memnon will show up at the battle at all. Priam seemed to be increasingly concerned about Memnon's whereabouts and his willingness to aid Troy. Upon sight of Memnon arriving in Troy, Priam had this to say, Memnon, the gods have granted me the sight of your army, and of you yourself within this palace of mine. May they fulfill this further wish, to see the Argives all destroyed at once by the action of your spears. I am amazed to see that in every feature you are like an invincible god, surpassing any earthly warrior. That's why I believe you will bring destruction to my foes. But for today, Enjoy the pleasures of this feast. Hereafter, you shall fight a battle to suit your worth. Memnon responds to Priam in a graceful manner and states, A feast is not the place to make enormous boast, nor yet to commit oneself to a promise, but quietly to dine in the hall and make appropriate plans. Whether or not I am brave and strong, you soon shall learn in battle. That is where the strength of a man is seen. Now is a time to think of resting, not of drinking through the night. Excessive wine and lack of sleep are troublesome for a man who is keen to engage in fighting. Memnon's army is described as being too big to be numbered, and his sudden arrival is met with a huge banquet in his honor. Priam is left with a sense of hope that Memnon will be the savior of Troy. 
Before the battle takes place the next day, so great is the divine love towards Memnon that Zeus commands all the Olympians to promise not to interfere in the fighting. As the battle ensues, Memnon kills Nestor's son, the godlike Antilochus, after Antilochus killed Memnon's beloved Aethopes. Nestor, seeking revenge despite his old age, tries to fight the Ethiopian king, but Memnon insists that it would not be proper to fight such an old man. In this regard, Memnon is seen to be very similar to Achilles. Both of them exhibit a strong set of values that are looked upon favorably by the warrior culture of the time. Quintus tells us, Such was Memnon, driving the Argives down to the beaches of the Hell's Point, killing them from behind as he went. Many there were who lost their lives in the dust and blood at the Ethiopians' hands, and the earth was defiled with the gore of dying Danans. Great was the delight of Memnon, ever pursuing the enemy ranks, and with their corpses the soul of Troy was crammed. When Memnon reaches the Greek ships, Nestor beseeches Achilles to fight him and avenge his godlike son Antilochus, which leads to the two men in fighting and conflict. Both Memnon and Achilles are wearing divine armor, which strengthens the many parallels we see between these characters. It is interesting to note that Zeus takes no sides in the conflict, but eagerly awaits the result. In fact, Zeus favors both of them and makes each man tireless and turns them into giants so that the entire battlefield can stop and watch Memnon and Achilles clash as demigods. Finally, Achilles gets the upper hand and stabs Memnon through the heart, causing the Trojans and Ethiopians to run in fear. Memnon later becomes immortalized in literature, art, and folklore. He was highly favored among the gods, and the blood that seeped from him was used by the gods to create a river. Well, I'm pretty much all out, guys. If you want access to sources to this video, or if you just want to take full-blown courses in African history, I offer them on Patreon. It's in the description box below. It's your boy, home team. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Higher the higher man, smoking the fire and I am way higher than